good morning. <clears throat> My voice is still a little messed up, but I'm doing a little bit better than last week. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, most importantly, uh, as I was talking to a gentleman from another church who mentioned many people at his church were getting corona. We know that it had run through another church in town a month ago or two, two months ago. So I encourage you, wear your mask when you can, wash your hands when you can, say howdy from a few steps back. We're just not quite ready to be hugging everybody yet, for those of you who actually hug people. <clears throat> not everyone's a hugger, I get that. But again, I did better safe than sorry on that one. We've been marrying masks this long, so another bit won't kill us. Uh, also, in the back of every uh, seat is this advertisement. It's the Light and Life Bookstore, the Light and Life Weekly, the magazine. Light and Life is, of course, through the Free Methodist Church. <clears throat> take it with you. Take it home. And this is along the same lines of extracurricular activity. Can you make it to church? Great. I think you're doing good. Not everyone can do that. Some people can actually make it to an extra service during the week, a Bible study, a thing. Great. Some people can actually read a little devotional in the morning or evening. Great. And this is just another way of getting something in there. It mentions the website. It mentions the bookstore. It meant, you know, so take that with you as a possible way to feed yourself, encourage yourself in the Lord. Other things that need to be mentioned? No uh, Bible study Thursday night next week due to Thanksgiving. Uh, no men's breakfast Friday morning due to the fact that I'll probably be full from Thursday. No, I just, uh, everyone's. Uh, so no uh, men's Bible study breakfast on Friday. Anything else? Then let us pray briefly. Gracious Lord, as we enter into your house, as we spend some time to worship your holy name, guide us and be with us. And may our voices be pleasing to your ears as we worship the Lord. Good morning, afternoon. They say sometimes you win some. Sometimes you lose some Right now, right now I'm losing back Stood on this stage night after night Mind in the broken, it'll be alright Right now, right now I just can't easy to sing there's nothing to bring me down what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand but he even if you don't, my hope is you alone. It takes just a little thing to move a mountain. Well, good thing, little faith is all I God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, give me the strength to be able to sing. It is well with my soul. I know you're able and I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word but even if you don't my hope is you alone you've 
God is able, and it is well with my soul. As we go further into our worship service this morning, I would ask that with me that you would just consider the reality of Jesus Christ. The fact that not only is he real, but he promises us that if we will allow Jesus, and I say aloud because Jesus won't go anywhere he's not invited, that if we will allow Jesus to come into our hearts and be there for us, that we will have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There's an old hymn that says, no, never alone. And sometimes we can feel alone, but I can tell you that the Holy Spirit never turns his back never goes away, and the reality is he's there for us. Bow your heads with me. Consider that reality. He knows what we need. He knows what we want, and he's always there. God, we do consider the reality of Jesus Christ. We do know that we can say regardless it is well with my soul. The world around us may look a little dark. We may see some crumbling of hopes and dreams. But again, the reality is Jesus Christ. As we go into the rest of this service, Lord, I pray that you would bless our pastor as he brings the message that you have given him for us. I pray, Lord, that we would listen more than we would talk, that we would pray, that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are safe in the palm of your hand. And let us act that out throughout the rest of this day and this week. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for your reality. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like, please stand. At your feet, Lord, I bow. Search me, O oh God, and know me now. Take this sin from my heart. I want to be just as you are want to be clean 
I want to be pure I want to be holy I want to be yours At your feet Lord, I bow. Search me, O oh God, and know me now. Take this sin from my heart. I want to be just as you are. I want to be Nothing worth more that will ever come close. 
nothing can compare You're our living hope Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is on your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts want to be. I wanted to say uh, howdy <clears throat> to some of the people online, but I noticed some watch later in the day, some watch on Monday. Uh, so I just want to say hi to, I see John on there once in a while and Amy and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is still a little off, but it is doing better. It was worse. Uh, uh, Marilyn on there, uh, Bonnie's on there, Jeff's on, and these are people all around. Uh, um, you know, all sorts of people. I can't think of them all right now. But uh, thank you for joining us, even if it's a bit later in the day or tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I have been looking at quite a few of the Psalms, the book of Psalms. <clears throat> Almost sounds like I'm underwater. <laughs> yeah. uh, hang in there. This is the best it gets. And this is a very uh, well-known psalm, as was Psalm 23 and Psalm 22. Psalm 51, Psalm 51. And there is a script at the top before the actual verse starts. It says this, for the director of music, a psalm of David. 
Now, Psalms 22 said something like that. A Psalm of David for the director. Remember, Psalms 22 said, to the tune, the doe in the morning, or something like that, you know, the, the deer in the morning, whatever it was. Well, this one has a, a, little, uh, a little piece that helps you understand the song better. It says this, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after, he had after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, he wrote this after he had just been outed. He wrote this after he had just been caught in not only adultery, but that turned into a murder plot, if you know the story. Uh, there are songs that mean a lot more when you understand the background behind them. Uh, back in the day, there was a song by Triumph, Fight the Good Fight. Fight the good fight, everybody, every moment, every day. Fight the good fight. When you realize he wrote it for his, I believe it was his aunt, or someone dying, uh, fighting cancer. You know, the song means so much more. Well, the same being said here, uh, when the prophet Nathan came to him. So for those, most everyone knows the story. I'll make it quick. King David's had some pretty good events. I mean, there was a whole Goliath thing. He came out pretty good there. He became king. He had ups and downs, but God's been with him. I mean, there's people out to kill him, and God has protected him and guided him and helped him out. He's had some miracles with God. By this point in his life, he's moved into Jerusalem. He set up camp. Uh, it says he actually has eight wives, the Bible records, and many concubines. It numbers 10 at one point. It doesn't say that was all of them, right? So eight wives, <clears throat> 10 concubines, and he's up on the palace of his roof. It says it was a time when Kings went to war, but he didn't go to war. Whatever reason, he was up there milling about. And from his little palace rooftop, he sees, and it's, I don't think it was quite as elaborate as some, you know, it's not exactly Buckingham Palace or something, you know. But from up on his rooftop, he sees a woman bathing, and he desires her, Bathsheba. Well, this learns into acquiring about her, spending some time with her, she becomes pregnant, but her husband's out of town fighting the war where he should have been at. He comes up with a great plan, get the guy to come back. Even though timing will be a little off, hopefully he'll think it's his kid. He won't even go home. Uriah won't even go home. He says, how can I go home to my wife when my fellow brothers are dying in the field? Right? A man of honor, a man of integrity. So, so much for pinning the, she's pregnant, so so much for pinning the kid on, on him. He comes up with another plan. When the fighting gets tough, pull back and leave him out in front. He sends the guy's death sentence with him as he goes back to the war and gives it to the general, this information that you're supposed to, right in the heat of battle, pull back and let this guy die. And it happens. So King David, guilty of adultery and murder, though he didn't technically pull the trigger, still guilty of murder. Then... The very next chapter, that's first, uh, 2 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 12, right after that passage, it says, Uriah is dead. He moves Bathsheba into the palace or whatever. Everything's going on as usual. Very next chapter, the very first verse says this. Verse 1. Uh, 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 sorry, excuse me. In chapter 12, not, not the psalm. In chapter 12, it says, Nathan the prophet came to him. He's been there before. He's been around. Nathan shows up and says, there's this problem you've got to hear about. You've got to hear about it. It's horrible. Oh, what is it? What is it? The king's going to make a judgment on this. He says there's these two guys. One's rich. He has possessions. He has lambs. He has all sorts of stuff. And he is wealthy. Another guy is poor. But he's got a little family, and he's got one little, one little sheep, one little lamb. And he loves it. It's like a pet. They have it with them. It's in their home. It lays with them. It's not, it's not a meal. It's a pet. Well, the rich guy has someone come to visit, and he wants to make a meal, but he doesn't want to waste his own stuff, so he goes and takes the one little sheep from the poor guy. King David is angry and furious. It says, the man who did this must surely die. And that's when Nathan hits him with both barrels of the true shotgun because he said, the man is you. He had his wives, he had his concubines, he could have added to their number, but no, that wasn't enough. He had to take the wife of Uriah. 
He had all of it he could have, and he could have had more, but it wasn't enough. He had to take the wife Uriah. <clears throat> this is both a good thing and a bad thing. Bad for King David. Um, it's good in the sense that it, a lot of the biblical characters who are famous, mentioned in Hebrews 11, are somewhat flawed. Just, you know, some of them a little, some of them a lot. And it just lets us know that God works with flawed people. Now, this doesn't mean go out and try to be flawed. I'm not trying to encourage you in sin. But inside your heart, if you just think you've gone too far, you've messed up too much, you're too far from God, uh, he does work with the broken. He does work with sinners. And there's hope for you. That's all I'm trying to say. So, he's got hit with both barrels. I mean, you can be caught red-handed. And I mean, your heart just sinks, you know what I mean? You know, you, just as you're reaching for that candy bowl, you know, Daz, what are you doing? You know, busted. But on top of this being busted, he's pronounced judgment on himself through that story. I don't know if it could get any worse. And then he says, he wrote this right after all that had happened. What does he say? So verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Even though he has failed. And I think about it, he has seen God's mighty works. And then he failed. Now, the story of many people, the story of certainly the story of Israel, the story of some some of the people in the Bible. On top of that, he's seen all these beautiful works, he falls, he fails. He pronounces judgment on himself. But then he says, have mercy, O God. Because of something he did? No. Because of your unfailing love. Because God in himself, and who he is, part of him is unfailing love. So while he deserves judgment, he knows he does. He just can, you know, uh, said it himself. He also knows God can Forgive, because that's who God is. Not that he's, hey, I, I killed the Goliath guy. I did this. I did that. You owe me a, a favor here. People are like that. I've heard people talk like that about God. I've tried to do what's right. I've tried to take care of my family. You know, why won't God throw me a bone here and help me out? And Jesus said even sinners take care of their families. Just throwing it out there. Here, he says, because of your, unf according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, not what he did, who God is, blot out my transgressions. Verse 2, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then he talks a little bit more about who he is. Verse 3, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Where is his sin at? Always before him, out there in front, you know. His own sin. He doesn't say, hey, I've been a pretty righteous guy. This is just my first little faux pas, my first little peccadillo. Let's just overlook this. He says he is a sinner. He knows his transgressions. My sin is always before me. And then he says something, verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. <clears throat> now, technically... My guess is he sinned a bench against Uriah. That's the dead guy, you know? And, of course, the adultery and the murder plot. But he's making a point. Who makes the rules? It's not Uriah. It's not Bathsheba. If it was up to us to make our rules as far as what, you know, to get by, what goes, um, we have a habit of making them for our own benefit, what best suits us. I said, you see this as silly as people arguing over a board game. You know, you see this as silly as a, a small, a child sporting event. Two people are arguing the rules and the best way to possibly interpret it. One's better for the one team and the other one's arguing better for their team. Same play happened, same condition, but two people are seeing it in the best possible light and trying to quote their laws or rules to get their side the advantage. No, it's not about our rules, our laws, our codes. It's about God's laws. God's, who's the best person possible to make a rule like this? God. I've done what is evil in your sight. <clears throat> yes, there can be uh, collateral damage, and there was. 
But he goes on to say, you are right in your verdict and justify when you judge. And in the story, if you read through uh, 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 chapter 11, 2 uh, Samuel chapter 11, uh, there is some consequences. The Lord says, I'll forgive you. You're not going to die, but you're not getting off scot-free. The things you did in the darkness will be done to you in the daylight. And at some point, one of his sons would start sleeping with his concubine in broad daylight, so all could see. Uh, a poetic justice, technically. Uh, verse five, surely I was sinful at birth. Surely from the time my mother conceived me. And sin is close by, sin is always close by. Here he's saying it is from the get go. People have a hard time with this. And most of us believe there is an age of innocence in a, you know, in a child's development. But it isn't too long at all before a child develops sin. And we don't teach them this. We don't tell them, okay, I realize you're only one and a half. You don't have a lot of words yet. You're still filling your pants periodically. But if your brother takes your toy, you pick up something heavy and crack him over the head with it. Right? We don't tell them that. We don't teach them that. But they do it. Why? Why? How do they figure that out? Where do they get, you know, are they watching too much late night television? You know? How about the, the wee toddler, you know, face full of crumbs and cookies? Did you eat the cookies I told you not to eat? They look at you with a smile. No. You know, did you tell them that's how you're supposed to lie? Then they get better at it. They learn. You lie. You stick to it. You look straight. You don't smile. You don't waver. You just keep saying the same thing. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I, do we teach them to do that? No. They just learn it. So you can see this sinful from a uh, young age, sinful at birth. But there is this big but. Verse 6. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. So in spite of sin being prevalent, there's also God's direction. There's also his wisdom. He wants to teach you something different. No different than any parent trying to get their child not to crack their brother in the head with a large toy. So he says sin is there, but he says God is there. He says his uh, punishment is there, but also God's forgiveness is, is there. That's the way he sees God in spite of where he's at right now. I just encourage you to think on some of these thoughts. Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I mean, that's a transformation. To be clean, to be whiter than snow. To be clean from all of your, you know, the filth of the field, the mud, the sweat, the daily toil. And to be rinsed and cleaned and made whole and, you know, fresh. It's invigorating. You understand. Well, he does, say, he does say, wash me with hyssop. And we'll take a little turn in the back of the picture. Uh, you can see it at home uh, next to me here. Uh, that is hyssop. It is a plant and it is technically known as Origanum syricanum. Syrac syricum. Origanum syricum. Uh, it's also called Biblical Hyssop, Bible Hyssop, Lebanese Oregano, and Syrian Oregano. This aromatic perennial herb is part of the mint family. Well, in the Bible, it's mentioned quite a few times. Uh, the Bible mentions hyssop several times, mostly in the Old Testament. In Leviticus, God commands his people to use hyssop in the ceremonial cleansing of the people's houses. In one example, God tells the priest to use hyssop together with cedar wood and scarlet yarn and the blood of a clean bird to sprinkle a person recently healed from a skin disease like leprosy. This act would, be, would ceremonially cleanse the former diseased person and allow them to re-enter the camp. Uh, the same method again was used to purify a house that had been previously contained with mold. Passover, that still celebrated time in Jewish history when... Egypt was receiving its plagues. The first, the death angel was coming. The firstborn were going to die. But if you took the blood of the lamb and applied it over your doorstep, and it says with 
hyssop. The, the branch is fairly sturdy, so it could be used as a paintbrush, if you will. If you apply the blood of the lamb to the doors and the top of the post, the death angel would pass over you. Hyssop being used there. So you can see in the ceremonial aspect it's used is uh, in the sense of cleansing. Uh, and I believe that's the way uh, David is using it. Uh, hyssop is also used symbolically when the Israelites marked their doorpost again. Uh, probably the hyssop was sturdy, could withstand it. It goes on to say it signifies as marking. Oh, and then uh, Jesus on the cross. Someone handed him a drink of uh, wine vinegar on a sponge, and the sponge was attached to a stick of hyssop. It's mentioned. So a little detour there, but uh, it's not just a word. It has quite a history to it, this hyssop. King David keeps talking about his difficulties, his hope, his dreams. Look at verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Uh, gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. So he wants to hear joy and gladness, which means he's currently not hearing joy and gladness. Uh, can sin rob you of your joy and gladness? By, well, sure it can. You thought it was going to be better. You thought it was going to get you out of trouble. You thought you were getting something from it. And the reality is you lost, and in this case, joy and gladness. Can sin, then, interesting thought, can a sinner get from that place of joylessness and gladlessness? Can he go from a place of rejoicing? In God, yes, and King David certainly thought so. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. <clears throat> Without having to explain too much, this is a reoccurring biblical theme. I mention these from time to time. If we're going to build up our Christianity, let's, let's start picking things that are reoccurring, you know, things that are clearly taught. Not a one-verse wonder. There's other cults that do that. But, you know, a, uh, you see a steady, clear teaching reiterated throughout the Bible. Own it. Learn it. Realize it's being taught to you over and over again so you get it in your head. Right? This fact that God can hide his, hide his face from sins, he can blot them all out, is a reoccurring theme. Uh, it happens in Isaiah. First, uh, in Isaiah, the Lord speaking says this to the Israelites. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. He says, your hands are full of blood. But then he says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Why? Because they're often oppressed. And he says in verse 18 of Isaiah 1, Come now, let us... Settle the matter. Let us reason this out. Let us figure this out, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, same type of language as David, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The message of the cross is the same message. Look to Christ as your final and ultimate sacrifice. Follow his teachings and find that your sins are forgiven. And this is not just an intellectual idea. Uh, many a Christian can feel it. There's a point in their lives where they realize, God has forgiven me. Those things I did, God has forgiven me. Again, this is not carte blanche to keep sinning. Uh, there are people who do that. God loves to forgive. I love to sin. We'll just keep on going, you know. Uh, did I say that right? Uh, and there are a lot of people who take that attitude. That is not being taught here. That's not being taught in Isaiah. That's not a teaching of Jesus. Just keep sinning and it makes you go to church once in a while. A lot of people have that idea. I'm encouraging that it is incorrect. That is not what God wants. In fact, I know what God wants. He says what he it says right here what he wants. Verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
according to King David, according to verse 10, where is the problem? His heart. It's internal. It's on board. It's hardwired. Create me a clean heart. You got to change this, the way I'm thinking, the things I feel, my desires. Change them. Make them pure. Much like the song we sang today. Oh, God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Get me right. The problem is on the inside. And you know what's funny? When we talk about sin, so many people blame the outside. Events, other people. Well, I wouldn't have done this or that if this would have happened. Uh, you know, I had a chance to do this and this, but someone, you know, I got torpedoed, you know. I got blindsided. I could have been this, this, and this, or, or how, about, how about something as simple, as I point over to some law enforcement people, how about a, something as simple as a traffic ticket? How many people would say, there's so many other people going so much faster than me, why would you possibly, you know. So they don't, they don't say they weren't sinning, they weren't speeding, they're just saying there's more worse off people Speeders, go get them, not me. That is incredibly common, incredibly common. That's not what David does. The problem is the heart. The problem is the heart. Uh, I've actually got out of a ticket once or twice for telling the truth. Really? Really? Yeah, I deserved the ticket. And the guy pulls up, you know, I just got the car started. In fact, it was my GTO. I burned out through a stoplight. I told him I just got to start. It was the first time I'd driven it in a while. And, and there was a person stuck in the intersection. And I went to honk the horn, but my horn wasn't working. You know, the privilege of owning an older car. And so I just floored it, laid rubber, just went around everybody. I was to the next light before anyone made it through that mess. But the first one through was a cop with his lights on. I, ex I explained it to him. I told him the mess. And the, he even said, oh, okay, well, you don't have any record of anything. All right, well, you know, let me go, let me go. I can't say that for the last ticket I got, which I also was guilty of. In fact, technically the ticket was wrong. No, it was. He said I was doing 99. And I mean, his thing was broken because I was going faster than that. <clears throat> my first and only speeding ticket but in my little black uh, sports car. I admit that many years ago, I have repented since. Uh, look at verse 11. On top of trying to get his heart right, on top of trying to, to have a spirit renewed with him, he says, do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. What is he talking about? The penalty of his sins could cause him not to feel the presence of God or to see God working. Sin could cause him not to feel the Holy Spirit guiding and directing him. Many people get to this place and say, I find no, no pleasure in church. I find no pleasure in the things of God that I once did. But that's not the end. Just because you feel that way, it's not the end. Look what he says in verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant to me a willing spirit to sustain me. Joy, he talks about. Joy in knowing who God is and what God does. His salvation. That's a game changer for Christians. It certainly changes them. To so understand this, to feel this, to think it. Grant me a willing spirit. Amen. Because what gets in the way? An unwilling spirit. When you want to do what you do and you know God wants you to do something else. Sustain me. Joy can return. Then look what happens in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. That even though he has fallen and failed and nobody's going to forget this. I mean, we're still talking about it a couple thousand years later. How's that for your sins being remembered? But he still knows that if God can deliver him, he will go out of his way to tell the story, to testify, is what Christians call it. To tell the story of where I was before God and where I am now. And it doesn't have to be delivered from uh, death, which was technically uh, David deserved to die. Uh, it doesn't mean that necessarily. We have to all have a story like that. But many Christians have a story of just being lost. 
meandering through life, trying this and trying that, each time thinking maybe this is it, maybe this will help. A, you know, a guru, a thinking, a teaching, a new relationship, a new place to live, constantly trying to fill the hole. And then they realize nothing could complete them except for God. Uh, Augustine said, you know, Lord's our heart are restless until they find their rest in you. Uh, Blaise Pascal said that inside each and every one of us is a God-shaped void, a God-shaped vacuum, and only he can fill. <clears throat> Think about that, like a puzzle piece. God goes there. And we go out and grab something else. You know, square block and the round hole, triangle doesn't work. You know, maybe we try to peel off a couple of edges and alter something to make it. Nothing works but God. And, and to this day, Christians still testify to these things happening. Verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. He knows what he's guilty of. He could, he could try to argue, well, you know, I set it up, but I didn't pull the trigger. That was a general who left him out there. He owns up to it. He doesn't try to pawn it off. Guilt of bloodshed, oh God. You are my God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness even if his righteousness isn't that clearly abundant. Verse 15, open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. And it is right after this event and continues to. I mean, we're reading his words, the words of a murderer, an adulterer. But then he says in verse 16, this is something people need to remember. Verse 16, you do not delight in sacrifice. Or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. What could King David do? Well, he's a king. He's probably got some resources. Not just kill a bull. He could kill 20 bulls. I mean, he could have a, you know, a barbecue bonfire. I'm sorry, God. He could throw tons of money at it. But he says right here, you do not delight in burnt and, 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 and sacrifices or else I would do it. You know, if that's all it took, I'd do it. But you're bigger than that. You want more than that. He explains what God wants and what he's going to do. Verse 17, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Now, we read, it, we read the passage in Isaiah where God's not going to look at their prayers and their offerings because of their blood, bloody hands. Here he's saying that, you know, uh, God's not going to enjoy his sacrifices after reading that, wouldn't it be funny if you came to the conclusion that you could do a few things to appease God? I meet people like this all the time. You know, I've had a little bad luck lately. I put a little extra in the plate. Well, thanks, but uh, that may not be the problem. They certainly not fix it, you know. I want you to come to my house, you know, and, and uh, bless it. No, I can, certainly will, but... Uh, that may not be the biggest problem you have. Right? I've been wanting to come to extra Bible studies. I'm just, you know, that, that's a good thing too, but uh, it's going to it's, take place here. This, the problem is the heart. It's also a reoccurring biblical theme. Not what you do, but why you did it. And this is often forgotten because I keep meeting people who think they can do something. Do something. Verse 18, may it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Zion is the holy hill where the temple stood, often used to refer to that area, but sometimes in the, the area in the whole, Zion, the temple area in the middle of Jerusalem there. So build up the walls of Jerusalem, which of course make it strong, bring it back, because right now it ain't looking too good for the kingdom. Verse 19, then you will delight in the sacrifice of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered at your altar. Yes, you can do things that God is pleased with. You can do acts and things that God is pleased with. Once you get the heart straight, then you can do good deeds which God can look at and bless you and know that you're doing his will and feel it and feel it. So that ends Psalms 51. Now I want to show you this next picture. Click. Uh, you don't know Brian. I don't know him that well. 
Um, actually, he's looking a little slender in that photo. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, it, he doesn't wear a top knot. That's actually a picture uh, a lamp or something behind him. This is Brian Warth, the uh, W-A-R-T-H, Warth. Uh, now, I actually met this guy a couple years ago at a church conference. He had a most interesting testimony and, and was preaching away and talking about his life and what God could do. Amazing story. Uh, oddly enough, we were sitting there at the hotel restaurant, and he was sitting a table away by himself. So I asked him, to, you want to join us? It was me, my wife, my son, uh, daughter-in-law, grandkids, you know. And he came over and sat with us for dinner. So I had dinner with this gentleman. Now, he grew up in the L.A. gang scene. Right? He, uh, but as he was growing up, his brother was already shot dead at the age of 15. By the time he was 14, he had been shot, I think, through the arm. By the time he was 16, he was arrested for murder for driving a car in a drive-by shooting where somebody was murdered. So at the ripe old age of 16, he is tried as an adult and sent to prison where he would spend the next 14 years of his life. 16 years old, you don't even know much about anything at 16. You might think you do, but you're, you're just about to start seeing things. You haven't even got that much figured out yet. And he is put away for 14 years. It said God got a hold of him. He tells a great story of the, he's sitting there, and a guy comes by with some Christian books, you know, and would you like a book, sir? And he's a you know, teenager waiting for his trial or whatever it is, you know, and... Uh, I forget what he says. I'm like, I don't need your books, old man, or whatever it was, you know. And the guy reached through the bars, held his hand, and prayed for him. And that day he found God. It wasn't the book, but the guy taking his hands and in the power of the Lord and the Spirit and the heart. Well, he spent those 14 years studying the Word, being a prison a pastor of sorts. He actually was released. Uh, by the then governor, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor there, uh, and uh, started working in churches, started pastoring churches, opened up some new churches, Chapel of Change, and he's got uh, some other campuses he works out of. And the reason I bring him up is that his life reflects that, I mean, he was guilty of murder. There was consequences to his crime, much like David. And he wasn't worthless. God could use him. He had value. When none of us would give some gangbanger in prison at the ripe old age of 16, much value, much hope. Huh? The reason I brought him up is that he popped up on my Facebook a couple of times this week, last week. Uh, one of them is because he had just appeared on the Dr. Phil show telling his story. It was taped. I don't think it's been released yet. That's the story we've been talking about. I mean, we can say, well, that's a Bible story. That stuff doesn't happen in real life. I'm telling you a story of real life. You can go to brianworth.com and start reading his life story if you wanted to. Read his book, uh, uh, Rise Up, Young Man. He's on the Dr. Phil show. And what is he doing? Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. He's doing exactly what King David planned to do. And if you do think, if you listen to anything I said, the same can be true for you. Follow Christ, follow his teachings, and focus on the matters of the heart, and watch God work miracles in your life. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this time. And for stories like these, may we learn from others' mistakes. May we learn from others' Uh, lifestyles, to see that God is in their lives. May we learn from that. May we emulate that, copy it, and we may tell others about you and your glory and what it does for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.